Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Uh, good afternoon. I am Crystal Clayville, a PhD candidate in religious ethics here at the Divinity School. And I've been given the task of introducing Professor Velker and the privilege to respond to his paper a little bit later today. By way of introduction, I must say that Professor Welker's degrees, honorary degrees, honors, and accolades are too numerous to name in full, so I will, I will merely hit the highlights. Professor Velker is a professor of dogmatics at Heidelberg University, where he is also the co-founder and managing director of the Research Center of International and Interdisciplinary Theology. He has lectured here at the University of Chicago previously, also at Harvard, Princeton Theological Seminary, and at Princeton Center for Theological Inquiry. In addition to visiting our hallowed halls, Professor Velker lectures internationally in Hungary, Korea, China, and South Africa. Since 2006, he has been actively building a global network of research centers for theology, religious, and Christian studies. He has wide-ranging interdisciplinary interest, as evidenced by his most recent publications. The Theology and Science Dialogue, What Can Theology Contribute? God the Revealed, a Christology. The edited volumes, Concepts of Law and the Sciences, Legal Studies and Theology, and The Human Person, Multidisciplinary Approach. He also has a book co-authored with Jürgen von Hagen entitled Money as God, the standardized monetization of the market and the impact on politics, law, religion, and ethics. Please welcome Professor Velker back to Swift Hall. Thank you very much. It is a great joy for me and my wife Ulrike to be back in this beautiful and radiant academic environment and to meet friends old and new. Um, I want to thank the organizers of this conference, uh, Professor William Schweiker, Miriam Renault, Joshua Daniel, Julia Woods, and the respondent, Crystal Clavel. God, theological accounts, and ethical possibilities. This title, in my view, can be interpreted as a loaded question. Namely, in what way can serious theological thought and communication about God provide ethical orientation in a complex, moral setting? In the search for an answer to this question, I will first try to identify ethical possibilities in today's challenging moral communication. The second part attempts to offer a genuine theological account related to your question. It will be based on key insights of the Abrahamic faith traditions in general and on biblical insights into the ethically orienting powers of God in particular. A third part, in a third part, I will sketch five aspects of spiritual life in the service of a multidimensional ethical orientation. First, a great example of shaping cultural and canonic memory. Second, a paradigmatic existential ethical experience. Third, an impact on humane social political ethos. And fourth and fifth, impacts on justice-seeking communities and truth-seeking communities. So I turn to the first part, ethical possibilities and challenges of moral communication today. Any serious search for ethical orientation has to face the complexity of moral communication in general. In moral communication, human beings influence each other by giving or withdrawing respect. We influence each other's thinking, acting, and behavior 
by giving or promising respect or by not paying respect or by threatening to withdraw it. The modes of respect come in a broad spectrum from a sharp, short view on each other up to vibrant admiration. The communication of respect starts in early childhood with seemingly simple operations. If you do this, your mom will be pleased. If you refuse to do that, your grandpa will be sad. More communication from seemingly simple attempts to teach a child up to the most elaborated functionalization of complex global media systems to cultivate general moral moods. More communication from adolescent mindsets to the categorical imperative. More communication is indispensable for common human life. We have to mutually attune our ways of thinking, acting, and behaving. And we foster this attunement by moral communication, by giving or withdrawing respect, by promising to give or threatening to withdraw respect. The indispensability of moral communication for social life is the reason why a naive perspective automatically links moral communication with a positive ethical orientation. Sadly, this is not necessarily adequate. Whereas many people still regard the processes of moral communication as occurring primarily in groups of interacting individuals, the contemporary situation challenges us to address a broader spectrum too. As William Schweiger rightly emphasized in the Companion to Religious Ethics, media-based global dynamics and, I quote him, global ref ref reflexivity the ways in which communities appear in the gaze of the other are of great moral import. In unprecedented ways, moral communication becomes culturally, politically, and religiously loaded and ideologically vulnerable. This observation should intensify worries generated by lessons learned from the past. We not only know of what I would like to term robber malls or a mafia ethos, we have also been shocked to hear of or witness the brutal fact that vast parts of human societies have been corrupted by ideologies of fascism or apartheid or ecological brutalism. Vast parts of human societies have given respect to evil forms of thought and action and continue to do so. And they have developed and still develop routinized forms of withdrawing respect from those who speak up against the powers of evil. Theologically, we are dealing with the difficult topic of the good law under the power of sin. We have to face the sobering fact that the indispensable and formally valuable moral communication among human beings can transport a false and even evil ethical orientation. When we speak of ethical possibilities, we have to take such, such potential distortions into account. The other basic problem associated with the talk about ethical possibilities in contemporary situations could be termed the complicated normative texture of pluralistic societies. When most people, even scholars, think and speak of pluralistic societies today, they as a rule still imagine a multitude of free and equal individuals and a multitude of groups and associations with very different backgrounds of education and worldviews, with different political, moral, religious, and professional interests and orientations. In this texture of a vague plurality of orientations, some people see an enormous potential for colorful development and flourishing human freedom, and other people evaluate the same setting as a chaotic, radical individualism and relativism which endangers or even destroys any normative thinking and any potential for moral education. The perception of pluralism 
as a vague plurality of individuals and social formations, however, can only grasp one as aspect of late modern societies in the West. It appreciates the affirmation of individual freedom, radical equality, and the human right to participate as a respected voice in all sorts of general and specific moral reasoning at any time. However, this understanding does not see that pluralistic societies are also heavily normatively coded. More than 30 years ago, David Tracy opened our eyes to the fact that all theological and moral discourse has to differentiate among academic, ecclesial, and moral political publics and the different styles of communication and normative orientation. With this great book, The Analogical Imagination, he took an important step towards a serious analysis of the culture of pluralism. Many of us began to acknowledge that in late modern pluralistic societies, there are different overt or latent value systems, institutionalized rationalities and normative expectations that guide or even dominate the different so-called social systems. That is, large organizational structures that are indispensable for common life and the common good. They include not only politics, the academy and religion, the famous Tracy differentiation, but also the legal system, market and media, family and education, even the systems of healthcare and the military and police. All these social systems form a complex pluralistic network of normativity and moral orientation in present-day societies in the West. This network is hard to grasp since healthy pluralistic societies refuse to bring the different value systems under the dominance of just one of these large organizations, institutions and powers. In the 1930s, the Germans destroyed an emerging pluralistic society in their country by permitting the dominance of politics, technology, and the military, the Nazi Gleichschaltung, an enforced alignment over the other systems. Today, many of us fear that the market, the media, and technology are imposing their rationalities and dominant values on the other domains of our societies in a distortive and even destructive way. Late modern pluralistic societies, however, are not only shaped by a general affirmation of individualism and by the powers of the social systems. They also develop a multitude of publicly operative associations, interest groups, parties, lobbies, social movements, etc. A significant number of these associations are interested in shaping the flux of power between the large social systems and pluralistic societies. Together, these associations, those who are interested in shaping the flux of power between the systems, are called civil society, or at least we should be aware that only these groups are the civil society. Uh, one of the big mistakes in uh, Habermas is that from canary breeding clubs to churches, everything is seen as civil society. This is not the case. I think civil societies, if you want to read the power flux in our late modern complex uh, societies, um, civil society are those groups and associations who try to shape uh, the power play between the social systems. The civil society stands between the social systems and the plurality of individual identities. If we want to identify ethical possibilities in contemporary Western contexts, we have to deal with the complex configuration of individualism, the highly normative binding powers of the social systems, and the creativity of civil societal groups and institutions. We have to identify the different hierarchies of values that govern the different social systems and their moral textures. Thus, for example, for family, love seems to dominate the other values and virtues. For the law, it is justice. For the media, resonance. For the academy, truth, etc. But it is not the case that a single value alone 
dominates and rules the whole system. Neither is it the case that only one set of values rules the whole society. The different hierarchies of values are interwoven and interconnected in various ways, giving a complex social and moral coherence and a deep, though often vague, sense that they serve the common good. Any realistic search for ethical possibilities in contemporary contexts has to decode the moral fabric of complex pluralistic societies at least partially. It has to ask how the interplays and the conflicts among different value systems shape the character of individuals and their moral visions. Where do the social systems show moral boundaries and even display distortive powers that have a negative impact on promoting the common good? What are their intrinsic strengths that should be emphasized in an individual's upbringing, in public education, in political, legal, and religious shaping of minds and mentalities? The identification of mutually strengthening interconnections of normative radiations between orienting powers in law, religion, the academy, family, media, the market, politics, and education will be crucial. With this complex texture in mind, we have to ask for theological insights and accounts that have or can have an impact on ethical orientation. And so I turn to my second part. the orienting power of God and theological accounts in a finite world. In the academy in particular, we have become used of, to speaking of theology in generalist and relaxed ways. All sorts of metaphysical and popular philosophical God thoughts pass as theological reference to God. Examples are the absolute, the infinite, Cusanos, the first cause, uh, Dionysius and Thomas Aquinas, the ground of being, Tillich, the ultimate point of reference, um, Gordon Kaufmann, the all-determining reality, Pannenberg, Bultmann, and others. Many scholars declare these, this speculative toolbox, as I would name it, a theological resource, and they even assure us that real communities of faith can identify in these speculative ideas and thoughts the God in whom they invest their faith and put their trust, in whom they worship and adore. A basic problem with many of these God thoughts was and is that the more perfect and powerful the God they presented looked, the more they ran into problems to make sense of the real world that their God idea was supposed to rule. Think, for example, of the God of Bultmann and Pannenberg as the all-determining reality, the alles bestimmende Wirklichkeit. How does this idea relate to a world in which we witnessed the death of thousands by a tsunami, children dying of cancer, and what is termed civilized societies erecting concentration camps and murdering millions of innocent people? Correspondingly, if we do not deny that nature and life are ambivalent, that all natural life is frail and finite, that all natural life must live at the expense of other life, and that on top of this natural condition of causing decay, human persons have enormous power of sin and destruction, then does this admission not destroy any perspective on God and divine goodness as well as any hope of gaining an ethical orientation from theological accounts. The first answer to this situation is, in my view, that we have to differentiate between totalitarian metaphysical accounts and theological accounts that have stood the test of time and experience in communities of faith. Second, that we have to admit that realism, and that is the will to test our insights by relating them to experience in natural space-time. That realism um, is absolutely crucial for any attempt to gain sound theological orientation in ethical affairs. Serious theological narratives and symbol systems are aware of the fact that the created world not only offers 
an enormous amount of fecundity, beauty, life-sustaining order, and many, many reasons for joy and gratitude, but that the same world is neither divine nor paradise. Even if we are vegetarians, we have to destroy an immense amount of life in order to sustain ourselves. Alfred North Whitehead is absolutely right in a statement, I quote him, all societies require interplay with the environment, and in the case of living societies, this interplay takes the form of robbery. The living society may or may not be a higher type of organism than the food which it disintegrates. But whether or not it be for the general good, life is robbery. End of quote. At the same time, natural earthly life is frail and finite and is bound toward decay and death. It not only develops many good and healthy strategies to fight against its own frailty and against the powers of endangerment and death, but intelligent life is also often quite sophisticated in developing strategies to deceive itself and others and to take much more of the life resources than are needed for its sustenance and defense. This is, in my view, the sober starting point of an encounter with the real world a starting point that all honest and realistic faith traditions and theologies challenge us to face. When we ask for divine guidance, care, and empowerment, we have to set out from these conditions and have to ask for an essence of life, my topic, that does not deny the vulnerability and frailty of natural life and the self-endangerment of all cultural life by the powers of sin. In many faith, faith traditions, the essence of life is associated with the power of the divine spirit. The spirit, however, must not be confused with the merely intellectual power. Aristotelian metaphysics, with its brilliant identification of spirit, self-reflexivity, reason, and the divine, produced lasting distortions on this frontier. Here, the biblical traditions, with their bewildering figure, of the outpouring of the spirit offer a helpful corrective. This figure confronts us with a formative, indeed with the constellation forming power. The divine spirit constitutes complex forms of community. At the same time, it challenges and transforms established natural and political orders of dominance and control. The great vision of the prophet Joel, Joel II, which is repeated and affirmed by the Pentecost account, Acts 2, describes a constellation in which males and females, old and young people, even maidservants and men servants, are brought into a spiritual community with its religious, communicative, and ethical radiations. And this is said in a patriarchal environment, in gerontocratic contexts, and, to be sure, in a slaveholder society. The Pentecost account quotes this vision of Joel and adds a breathtaking multinational, multicultural, and multilingual dimension. Other constellations of spirit-created communities emphasize the polyphony and the mutual enrichment and allow for different hierarchies of values and virtues and for their interplay in complex processes of communication. According to the prophetic visions of the biblical canon in both the Old and the New Testament, the constellation forming work of the divine spirit is quite subversive, even revolutionary. At least in what is known as the Abrahamic faith traditions, central values of the spiritual interplay attributed to God and to divine creativity and seen as ennobling human communication in the light of divine wisdom, are correlated to the law of God. The central interwoven values of the law are the care for justice, the care for mercy, and the search for truth in the solemn encounter with the divine. The messianic visions in Isaiah 11, 42, 61, see the chosen one of God on whom the spirit rests 
as exercising justice, bringing mercy to the weak and the poor, and true knowledge to Israel and also to the Gentiles. This cluster of values in justice, mercy, and truth-seeking communities run against the natural tendency of life to sustain itself at the expense of other life. Particularly revealing is the intrinsic correlation of justice and mercy. In both witnesses to God's creative, uh, creative guidance and normative ethical expectations. In a counterintuitive way, the power of mercy, that is the care for the weak, causes people to exercise a free and creative self-withdrawal in favor of another life. A free and creative self-withdrawal in favor of another life. Embedded in family life and in parental love, this tendency even appears natural to us. But what brings human beings to exercise mercy and loving care beyond their helpless children, their sick family members, and their old and frail parents and grandparents? The essence of life envisioned by the divine law and by the divine spirit sees a gain of life for persons who exercise this merciful, creative self-withdrawal in favor of the others. A gain of life that, uh, that to common sense thought can appear paradoxical. In mercy and in love, with its added dimension of joy in free and creative self-withdrawal in favor of others, in mercy and love, there are an essence and a growth of life that works against the powers of decay and death. This essence of life has many dimensions with strong impacts on ethical orientation. And so I come to my third and last part, spiritual life and multidimensional ethical orientation. The power of the divine spirit not only constitutes a polyphonic community centered on interconnected core values and practices such as the search for justice, the care for the weak, and the search for truth. The power of the divine spirit also opens the individual and communal human spirit and the personal identities in shaping most impressive realms of memories and imagination. The relation to the living God offers individual persons an enormous extension of the horizons of experience. They stretch far beyond the relation of family life and the relation to good neighbors and friends. One's own identity is seen with the eyes of God in broad historical perspectives. And this can bring an enormous sensitivity and capacity for empathy, empathy and responsible action in favor of other beings in need. The first dimension of spiritual life relevant to multidimensional ethical orientation can be illustrated with reference to the biblical traditions by what is called the motive clause of the Old Testament law. It, of, it offers a great example for the shaping um, cultural and canonic memory. The motive clause says, for you yourself were once foreigners in Egypt. And it says in its expanded forms, you yourself know how it feels to be foreigners. This clause can, with characteristic variations, be found throughout the Old Testament legal corpora. But why does this theological orientation not violate theological realism? Why do people who were never in their life in Egypt allow themselves to be addressed as those who were slaves and freed by God's hand? Why do they allow themselves to be embedded into a network of experience and in a public collective that transcends the realm of personally attainable experience? Why was this double identity, you were foreigners yet now you are free, not simply discarded or abandoned? Why were these legal and moral impositions of the mercy code not rejected with the Nichinian Führer? 
How did the law come to serve as the bearer of paradigmatic memory? We have to deal here with the discovery of great religious relevance and explanatory power. At each discrete point in time, people are incredibly unequal. Yet, this perspective changes when we picture ourselves with the eyes of God on an extended timeline and see both young and old, sick and weak people as not only among us and with us, but also in ourselves. The new perspective can foster a sensitivity for the fragility of all human life, which in turn promotes the co-evolution of the religious, legal, and compassionate moral codes that we encounter in the biblical law. With the motive clause, Israel expands a basic and undeniable experience of natural life into an historical dimension and the historical dimension in the religious and normative framework of experience. It transposes the sensibilities of familial solidarity into an historical sociopolitical dimension. This generates the mutual normative strengthening of the mercy code and the juridical code in the biblical context, but also in many cultures in general. God, theological accounts, and ethical possibilities. With the first explanation of shaping an individual and communal religious identity in favor of ethical orientation, we have related to Jewish and Christian faith traditions to biblical orientations. My main concern in this lecture, however, was and is a realistic approach that does not overrun and overrule the hard experience of frail and finite life and the frightening potentials of self-endangerment and destructive behavior connected with this creaturely condition. I tried and I tried to strictly avoid getting involved with images and ideas of God that invite us to ignore or even deny these experiences. Given this background, I attempt to focus on a non-illusionary essence of life in the middle of robbing, finite, and death-bound natural life. The spiritual realms of memory and imagination, however, differ in the diverse communities of religious and moral communication. So for people in other religions and secular traditions, my first point might fail the claim to be a realistic theological approach. It can only serve as an invitation to discover and develop cultural memories that sustain differentiated and empathetic individual and communal identities. And uh, although I just published a Christology, I refrained from offering you a wonderful Christological framework uh, of a rich identity in Christ and so on and so on. So I'm ascetic in this point here today. A second set of counterpowers against the tendency of natural life to sustain itself at the expense of other can offer a systematic claim. The interconnection of justice and mercy and the powers of love are experienced as ennobling with, beyond the circles of family, friends, and tribes. An essence of life in the middle of the ambivalent flux of natural life. In mercy, that is the care to the weaker and in forgiving, both in the relation of God to humans and in interhuman relations, we witness and experience a creative self-withdrawal in favor of the other, and this is not to be understood as a loss of life, but as a somewhat strange gain and growth, growth of life. These very down-to-earth spiritual experiences come with an existential broadening and deepening of the individual identity involved, which does not depend on broad cultural and canonic memory. To be sure, it can be greatly strengthened by cultural and canonic memory, cultivated, sustained. But it can also be seen as a paradigmatic general existential ethical experience. 
in many inconspicuous emergent ways, we witness the constitution of a community of the spirit that exercises empathy and compassion and generates moral standards beyond the realms of members of family, friends, and good neighbors. The theological strengthening of the development of this rich personal and social identity can counter reductionistic forms of subjectivist faith and existentialist mindsets forms that George Lindbeck identified as a stale, standardized, experiential, expressive model of religious self-awareness. Human beings who are able to experience and exercise a free and creative self-withdrawal in favor of others move beyond the pervading perspectives of self-sustenance and self-preservation. They move freely and realistically beyond what biblical traditions call a merely fleshly existence. Third, the interconnection of juridical law and mercy sustains values of social welfare, freedom, and equality. And it has a shaping impact on a humane socio-political ethos. Even as a latent pattern, this gains enormous educational and political function. It can even enable the juridical law to become a moral teacher, as Kathleen Caveney has argued in her recent book, Law's Virtues. The mercy law not only shapes moral and political moods in formative ways, it also draws impulses from and recursively strengthens the family ethos. In biblical times, this ethos was clearly connected to patriarchal structures, and not only in biblical times. The merciful father was the center of attention in family life, political life, and religious communication. But even perspectives critical of this role of patriarchy in the shaping of normative expectations should appreciate the fact that it replaced the king as the premier executor of mercy and clemency appeals. The inspiring spirit sensitivities against patriarchal, gerontocratic, defensive, tribal, racist, and classist structure are, however, badly needed to cultivate and promote an ethos of justice and mercy also in contemporary environments that tries to escape these tendencies or transform these. Fourth, in a direct impact on the juridical law, the mercy law strengthens and challenges the former's evolution and competence. It has a strong impact on justice-seeking communities, both in religion and in secular contexts. On the one hand, no case is imaginable that could fall below the competence of the law. No person, however weak, poor, and miserable, will fall below the levels of the outreach of the law. On the other hand, the systematic orientation of the law towards compassion demands the continual refinement of the legal culture and its directedness towards universalization. Beyond the strive towards a universal outreach of the law, the mercy code of the law helps us in dealing with a painful paradox that plagues all legal and moral evolution. This paradox is that on the one hand, we want to improve and develop the juridical law and our ethical standards. On the other hand, we want to provide legal and moral security of expectations. How can we take on this difficult yet unavoidable task of transforming and improving most important normative potentials without in this process destroying their binding force? Here the mercy code has a balancing function. Dynamics as well as stability are enabled when justice and mercy, law and compassion are put in a creative tension and in cooperation. Fifth and lastly, the readiness for joyful, free and creative self-withdrawal in favor of others is important for an ethos of truth-seeking communities in education, in the academy, and in communities with serious cultural, religious, and moral communication. 
All too often, the search for truth is reduced to the search for personal certainty or communal consensus. These perspectives on truth, however, are not sufficient. Obvious moral distortions teach us how dangerous the reduction of truth to subjective self-righteousness can be, or particularly in large publics, a consensus that immunizes itself against any critical perspectives on it. The search for individual certainty and for consensus is important for the search for truth. But it has to work on its constant growth and on the constant correlation with the search for correctness, coherence, and rationality. Particularly in academic contexts, however, we find the other side of the problem, the reduction of truth to adequacy to the topic, to coherence and rationality. And here again, we have to work toward improvement and the growth of coherent and rational insight into the encounter with sensitivities for certainty and consensus in non-academic experiential realms. In order to promote this double process, the growth of certainty and consensus and the growth of correctness, consistency and coherence, the search for truth requires the willingness for free and creative self-withdrawal in the communication and truth-seeking communities. The openness for the joyful, free and creative self-withdrawal in favor of another person materializes here as the openness and eagerness for the better, healthier, deeper, more convincing, more subtle, more illuminating insight. And this essence of life in the search for truth is also highly relevant for the flourishing of ethical and religious life. Thank you very much, Professor Velker. Um, I see my role as, uh, as a respondent as facilitating discussion of Professor Velker's, Velker's very engaging paper. As such, I will offer a summary of his paper from my perspective as a scholar working at the intersection of religious ethics, ecological thought, and biblical studies. Following that, I will offer some questions for discussion. I take Professor Velker's paper to be an answer to the question he poses early on. What kinds of theological insights and accounts can have an impact on our ethical orientation in a complex moral setting? His point of departure is a detailed account of our complex moral setting through an analysis of moral communication and the plurality of values communicated to us and through us by our social systems. He argues that within interpersonal relations, moral communication presupposes respect or a lack thereof. Moreover, these relations are dialogical in our current situation, moral communication can be easily distorted by cultural, political, religious, and ideological forces, in part due to the monological character of global media communication. While the paradigm for moral communication creates a conversation between individuals and social groups, within a setting of plural values, our dominant social structures, like the media, often reduce our plurality to a monologue. In addition to being social creatures who participate in a plurality of publics, we are also natural creatures. And as such, we are both predatory and vulnerable. As Professor Velcor puts it, life must live at the expense of other life. Within the complexity of our social and natural orientations, Professor Velcor develops the concept of the ascent of life which I take to be a theological concept that has the possibility of orienting our thinking about ethics. I have to think that Professor Velker has given us a nice wordplay here. The ascent of life is both a rising up of life from the reality of lived experience and an implicit ascent or yes to life, an affirmation to continue living despite the messiness and complexity of life, an ascent that must precede the upward climb. Yet the ascent of life also stands in stark contrast to the, to the descent of man. 
Rather than asking about origins, Professor Velker asks about our future. Rather than asking about the human in relation to nature, Professor Velker asks about the progress and ongoing complexity of all life and the human role in a common future. In developing the ascent of life, Professor Velker turns to resources that capture the realism of our co complex social and natural setting, resources that have stood the test of time and have been part of the experience of an ongoing community of faith. To no one's surprise, these resources are prophetic and legal forms of thinking from the Bible. More specifically, he focuses on the spirit in Joel 2 and its extension and reiteration in Acts 2, suggesting that the spirit creates complex forms of communities that upend the potentially monolithic social and natural values that often orient life. Instead of communities where life uses other life to sustain itself, Spirit-created communities prioritize care of the weak and socially disadvantaged. Professor Velker then correlates these values with the law of God, which integrates justice, mercy, and the search for truth. What is seen as the ideal community in Joel, a community formed by the divine spirit, is also the ideal community the divine law works to build. Giving further contours to the ascent of life, Professor Velker articulates five dimensions of spiritual life that have an impact on ethical orientation. The first, the perspectival shift in creation of empathy in the motive clause of Old Testament law. Second, the extension of ethical concern beyond kinship boundaries. Third, the unification of all people under the law. Fourth, the instilling of mercy as the correlate of justice, the balance and cooperation of both mercy and justice together. And five, the gift of the space for creative self-withdrawal in order to prioritize the needs of others, both in a social justice setting and later in an intellectual setting that is a community of truth-seeking. On my reading, these five dimensions are connected by a deep concern for mercy that infuses our interpersonal interactions and is the moral norm communicated by divine law. Now, because I have a special place in my heart for biblical law, I'm going to give a little more time to Professor Velker's exposition of the motive clause. The motive clause, as you recall, he stated is, um, for you yourselves were once foreigners in Egypt, and the more fully, um, fully articulated version also includes, you yourselves know how it feels to be foreigners. I find Professor Velker's reading of this motive clause quite compelling. This motive clause is the constellation of Israel's liberation narrative in the form of law. Here, the legal form is given a narrative warrant that shapes memories and imaginations to suggest that the others, the young, the old, the sick, the weak, and foreign, are not only with us, but are also in us. The motive clause adds a historical dimension to our very real natural existence. This historical experience of liberation is then given normative force in legal form. The double identity of slave and free is something we must all carry around, and this helps to orient our ethical action in a world of plural values. In short, our plural identities help us navigate a world of plural values. While I find this reading of the motive clause compelling theologically, it also raises some questions for me. There are a plurality of motive clauses in biblical law. There is also, in Leviticus, be holy for I, your God, am holy, which is a motive clause that functions on an imitatio dei model of ethics. And there is, um, in Exodus, right after the Ten Commandments are given, uh, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. And the implication within that motive clause is that it functions on a uh, do ut de model, the Latin form, um, suggesting that I did X for you, God did X, and therefore you must do Y. And so my question is, can these divine warrants for ethical action be part of a theological account of the ascent of life or do they stand in stark contrast to it? My second question concerns both the Bible and the environment. The spirit created community in Joel 2 is a response to the destruction of the day of the Lord, an apocalyptic natural and social destruction brought about by God for human sins. Do you see a similar temporal element in our current environmental situation? By which I mean, are we living in a time of social and natural destruction that requires the ethical response of spirit-created communities that can enact an ascent of life. And finally, I have 
something of a simpler question, a point of clarification. Um, I would like you to clarify. I'm not going to clarify. Um, at the outset of your paper, you argue that moral communication requires the gift of respect or its withdrawal. Could you expand a bit on what you mean by respect? Is it similar to recognition or approval? Is it a feeling of awe? Um, just a little background there would be helpful. And in general, thank you very much for your insightful and thought-provoking paper, and I look forward to further discussion with you and our interlocutors. Thank you. Thank you very much for your response. Um, maybe two or three uh, uh, points at the beginning. Um, one of my strongest concerns in this paper was um, to avoid a highly illusionary um, a confusion of life and nature with only good or in absolutely terms. So I cannot share this uh, um, Eocene Natura because of this problem that is uh, uh, involved in that. And I was looking for a type of essence of life that doesn't go with the robbing, decay structure. And here the notion of the great Sabbath for Abel Adams. Um, occurred to me as a helpful starting point. Um, I then used as one dimension of the illustration um, the power of cultural and canonical memory exhibited <coughs> in scripture, but you could also use other contexts, to develop differentiated identities. And you rightly pointed out that uh, differentiated identities as such can also be warfare models over So that it is very important to discern the spirits and to uh, look at the uh, identity patterns that are communicated by cultural and economic um, uh, memory. And here I found these figures of the pouring of the spirit and the relativizing of patriarchal, neurodemocratic, stakeholder, uh, uh, nationalist, tribalist uh, reforms very compelling. And I would say they are still compelling for us today. Um, finally, you said, well, giving and withdrawing respect. What do you mean by uh, respect? And uh, I try to say in my paper, um, um, this giving and withdrawing respect has a broad range. It is a sharp, short view. Yeah? Does he come late for the third or fifth time? Uh, can I continue? negotiations with this business uh, who failed to do this or that, up to strong admiration. Oh, this is a deal. I think this communication of respect is a kind of cool understanding of moral communication, and I learned this from Niklas Luhmann, a great sociologist who dethroned Habermas 20, 30 years ago, and, um, and has a sometimes a little cynical approach, but also uh, what I think is a more realistic approach than immediately communicating moral and ethically good communication. And I'm trying to say, because moral communication is indispensable for human life, be easily associated with good. It's like religion. Some people, when they hear religion, they associate it only uh, with good values. But sadly, this is not the case. And I want to open the eyes for this kind of differentiation and then and uh, show that moral communication as such can go with, uh, on different paths. And I think here a long tradition which uh, in invested the key insights that we have in not all but much family life, the kind of loving, caring, and the ethos of uh, 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 mercy embedded, the uh, associated natural life with um, um, necessarily good and life sustaining. But I think here we need a more nuanced and realistic approach. And this was my point when I got your challenging topic, um, ethical orientations and uh, uh, theological accounts. Uh, I thought that I should raise the attention to this uh, sometimes uh, troubling situation that 
people easily say, oh, you know, humans, animals, plants all need each other. Well, and then they just ignore that there is something like the food chain and, uh, and these things. Happen. Yeah, I did not want to quote John Poiking on those where we love to love the best. The streptococcus is the test. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the paper. Uh, I wonder, you seem to be suggesting uh, at times that having an for a society to be healthy, it was important to have a plurality of value institutions that are not um, in agreement with each other uh, rather than having some kind of monolithic uh, value hegemony in the, in the society. Could you say some more about how you yeah. see that working? I think ethical orientations, and I like this um, uh, approval in, 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 in it, that raises our attention uh, that we should not look for the big on switch where we can turn everything from light into darkness, but rather see where in our society, with what symbolic and other tools, can we change, transform, what develop. And where can we see that there are value systems that can work together for the good or, in a, or operate in a complicated way. Yeah. So very easily in our time we say, okay, the values of the market, uh, they are destroying everything. Yeah. We just had a multi-year uh, project on the standardized monetization, you quoted this, of the market and the impact of politics, uh, uh, law, religion and ethics. And uh, so this famous quote, God or Mammon, which runs uh, 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 all over, um, well, it demonized the market and, and alphabetized faith over against the market. And it's a problem. And we had economists and they told us 100% you can have no good experience of a complex society without a monetary system. So you have to be realistic and you have to yeah, then look what kind of uh, uh, you have to develop if you want to transform complicated um, uh, development. This is my kind of approach, that we have, need a multi-dimensional approach and that we um, then have to look what kind of perspectives out of our faith traditions can we invest in what context. And my experience is, in the beginning it's, it looks very, very sober. Yeah. I'm only an academic, and only a theologian, and only in the German tradition and only raised up in these and these years, and only a white man, and only, only, only. Yeah. So you almost go down into a mouse hole and have a feeling of, uh, where am I? But once you have this kind of uh, realism of contextualization, then you can say, but from this on, I can radiate in this and that, and from this on and that and that. Here I have these alliances and so on. And I think it's this kind of perspectiving approach that I would like to uh, promote and to and this also then, I, I became interested, although I'm a more systematic and philosophical uh, theologian from the outset, through Whitehead and Parsons and Luhmann and others, uh, and the multi-systemic approach, I became interested in working with the biblical traditions to see whether there are different um, uh, value systems uh, involved, and if you want to uh, reach something on that, you better go through these and these faith traditions and uh, symbolisms and so on. And this doesn't mean relativism, no, it's strength. And maybe one last point to you, monologue is not a problem, alone. It is, of course, can be a problem. The problem is that you have in our society uh, systems operating which cannot do other than following their uh, uh, normative codes. And that pluralistic societies have highly normatively coded forms. So uh, if you say, well, in the education system, I'm a teacher, I have to give exams, but I love these kids so much uh, that I will treat them as my little uh, beloved infants, give them a kiss in A plus, then you have a problem. And I think it is very important that you see, well, we have these normatively coded environments in which we have to opt in, in, a, in, a, in a certain way. And this blocks also some types of communication. So we are limited in our possibilities to yeah, uh, uh, reach out and uh, uh, infuse and uh, develop. But of course, we also have many, many potentials for creativity. 
So that we see under these and these and these conditions, we can bring law and the market and education and the academy in fruitful interaction and cooperation, and the, that this can has a, a quite an impact on our environment.
and a general role is given to this notion of spirit, and what kind of agency you see as both theologically present and as translatable in uh, uh, the pluralistic situation you see. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. And this is, of course, near to my heart because 20 years ago I worked on a book of, uh, on the spirit, but uh, uh, the deeper roots were in law traditions, and uh, this is still very much in my in my back. We have a lot of cooperation with theology and law in, um, uh, in these days, but it was already what I explained to you with Justice Mercy, and so this was very much on my mind, and here I could go on and on and on with different complex normativities. But uh, what I saw then, um, that I was so much driven into the law traditions that um, the, the gospel in Christian modes uh, was pretty thin. And, uh, and since my eyes were holed in Christology, I had only this part in what I call curiology uh, uh, available, I started with the notion of the spirit. And here one of my, the shocking and breathtaking experiences was that we have on the one hand this genius model of the Aristotelian spirit, which has dominated our intellectual tradition, rightly so, but which puts reflexivity, the identification of spirit, reason, the divine, um, and, and, and the growth of uh, uh, insight into the center. And that the biblical traditions with this notion of the outpouring have a different dynamic and that the, the biblical spirit is not self referential Enormous questions, how do you understand personhood then? And John Paul brilliant insight was its context sensitivity. Yeah, so, so you have to reshape the whole notion of uh, the, the spirit. It also helped me greatly to explore the polite anthropology and uh, to see that he, although a friend of re uh, reason, better five words with news than 10,000 times, um, that he sees this enormous dynamic of, of the spirit beyond the dynamics of spirit. So that all your memories, all your imaginations um, uh, constitute an, almost an ocean of your uh, uh, own mindset. And then you can really uh, uh, raise this enormous awe for the human spirit. But you also have to see the spirit, like the law, can be dominated by the wrong value systems. So you can get a very, very corrupted uh, uh, human spirit with an enormous power. Yeah? And coming from Germany and, and fascism and, uh, uh, and also a good experience of socialism in my childhood, I had to travel to East Berlin um, uh, three times a week because of second and choir there. And so, so um, yeah, you had this sensitivity, this awareness how dangerous uh, these powers of the spirit can uh, become. And then even later, you see that often latently you are polluted uh, uh, in your individual and communal spirit. So I think both dimensions are very, very important to me. Uh, and this also allows you to see the pouring of the spirit even in your own heart with cognitive qualitative emotional energies, so that you do not just regard yourself as a reference point, yeah. as we have done in post-Cartesian uh, modernity very often with the subjectivity or so, but that you see the, the enormous spreadsheet uh, uh, that uh, we are in our spiritual existence and the many energies that can have an impact on uh, uh, our minds and bodies. So I think these two dimensions I would like to bring together, the rich individual identity, which needs shaping by motive clauses of all uh, assaults and other forms, the differentiated experiences, and, and, and also the communal uh, type, the constellation forming power of the spirit. Can I follow up with just one yeah. Does that then kind of reshape for you uh, I would say so. I think I think that of course you have to go into a richer identity of the divine and the Trinitarian theology uh, uh, that uh, where I think the dialogistic or vague paragoretic uh, models are definitely not sufficient. Um, I'm curious to know to what extent you see these um, socially situated perspectival opportunities to engage um, various elements in society for <clears throat> an essential life as a moral calling and is it helpful and valuable to think
think of pursuing those opportunities uh, using that that lane? Well, I think I think so, and I tried it for my own um, humble existence, as I just described it. So we created um, the Center of International Interdisciplinary Theology, starting with eight units. Now we have 30 units where we have interdisciplinary constellations and uh, uh, theology and law, theology and medicine, um, um, Jewish studies and Christian studies, uh, uh, various areas, theology and science, um, and where we try to develop different forms of cooperation. So if you reach out to China, and we do a lot with uh, Chinese colleagues, uh, these and these constellations are more important. If we work with Russian Orthodox, these and these constellations are more important. And then we created a global network, also very interactive here with uh, Professor Schweiger and others, with now 45 universities on the, on the globe. Uh, still in the beginning, still modest, but uh, uh, so we try to develop power clusters, uh, uh, also on an international scheme. And not just exchange as such, no. Uh, what topic is relevant for these students and who are the colleagues we can best, best involve? So, in a way, we try to do in a globalized situation um, uh, what I try to refer uh, also in a civil societal pers perspective. Yeah, yes. Well, thanks, Michael. Wonderful paper. <clears throat> I want to push you on the content-laden concept of ask it has methodological implications. The, the content-driven uh, idea here is created self-withdrawal. A little bit more. In favor of that. Well, yeah, in favor of that. Does that, I'd like to hear you say more about that, but does it also function as a methodological principle insofar as most of the trouble you see in multi-systemic systems is the overreach of a set of concepts, which in theology we see through you know, exalted understandings of the unmoved mover, yeah. who supposedly, uh, and so old style metaphysical conceptions of the divine. So I was wondering if the particular content plan about creating self thought is also for you a methodological principle in looking at how different systems and their value codes work. Of course. Well, I couldn't agree more, though. And uh, my reserve over, uh, over against what I said, the, the speculative toolbox of many metaphysical approaches is guided by this reserve. That does not mean that I cannot wholeheartedly offer a tillic uh, thing and uh, walk the ground of being or even gradually listen to uh, Gordon Kaufmann's uh, ultimate point of reference, although I think it is in many ways a distorted um, figure of thought. But, but you can deal with this in a provisionary way and say, this functions in this and that respect, but. Yeah. And so uh, I think it's highly methodological. It, it is, uh, that you have immediately, whenever you use a framework of thought, uh, you have to check it. And here I learned very much of uh, Whitehead's critique of abstraction. So Whitehead has a, has a, uh, this, uh, a critique of abstraction that doesn't mean do not think in abstractions. No, you cannot uh, uh, deal without abstractions, and mostly they are latent. Your brain. Uh, very often, you have you know, modes of thinking that you shield from. As we keep them, as Parker Parson says, as latent pattern maintenance. Yeah, of course, but um, but you have to try to reach out to these uh, uh, abstractions and see what is their, what are the good powers and what are the distorted powers. And this not just on a on a, on a scheme of ideas, but and therefore I found your uh, invitation so good and so challenging. Uh, always also in an in interaction with modes of practices and behaviors. Yeah, so as long as we are just in the scheme of uh, ideas, things are comparatively easy. But as soon as we see the power structures of specific social systems and civil societal uh, uh, operations and configurations and uh, the political loadedness, then you can really test uh, um, creativity or the complicated potentials. So then that means that creative uh, self-withdrawal is in no way a kind of diminution of the self, or denial, right? No, but it is uh, that you that you try to look at the other perspectives, try as much as you can, put yourself into the shoes of the others, and try to see well where do we uh, feel uh, the potentials of development or also needs. 
And this here also, the, the strong motion on the squirt is helping. When you see the other person uh, with the wealth of developmental potentials, but also with the wealth of needs. And when the squirt is not only self-referentially driven, but also as antique notions of personal habit, the references of the other to them. And then you can also uh, enter all these problems, what do you do with acaphalic uh, uh, people and so on and so on. So then you get a very, very powerful notion uh, of the spirit and also the challenges involved in uh, encounters in real life. Yeah. Thank you for your intriguing lecture, especially intriguing. I found that we started out with the term respect, which I uh, interpret uh, and I wish you would say something more of it because I interpret it not first of all as a moral concept, but as a sort of phenomenological concept. Uh, 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 and uh, it, it is also interesting to me because that is precisely the way the Apostle Paul says in his uh, Romans uh, that the respect, yes, that is the basic concept, which is both phenomenologically oriented, that is because our eyes see something, which is not simply an object, it is something that we also understand, that we see rightly or wrongly. And that the response to it is uh, ethics, action. And that action also sees either that what we see is a gift or it is uh, the object of robbery. robbery you know, so. That it is, uh, respect is not necessarily the perception of uh, taking as robbery, it is also. <coughs> Uh, part of the uh, gift and counter gift uh, operation, which is uh, basic to all human life. And also beyond that, it's yeah. also basic to nature as a whole. And uh, so, in other words, could you say something about that as a concept? Well, basic to nature here, again, my reluctance would be yes, uh, sometimes yeah, but sometimes I also eat you up. Uh, so, um, this is uh, that respect. We have the saying, ich habe nicht zum Fressen gern. Well, and I think what I'm trying to do with the help of Luhmann and others is to translate a philosophical tradition uh, in which I grew up with Kant, Fichte, Hegel, and so on, and, uh, into forms where you can have the, the, the moral impetus as a kind of plural interaction communication scheme. Die Gabe und den Zug von Achtung in Kommunikationsform. Not only the self-referential questioning und Achtung für das Gesetz, um, um, uh, uh, but um, yeah, the communication form in which we uh, uh, acknowledge closeness, nearness, distance. Um, be careful in this respect, or here you have to learn, you have to admire, you have to follow, uh, uh, and so on. So I think this was the driving form. But I agree that I also, particularly in recent times, uh, we did more and more with Paul, also the interdisciplinary international project. Um, uh, I saw many, many communities. The terms of nature, uh, I acknowledge that I have more reserve for against uh, uh, the ambivalence or oh, oh, yeah, more um, alertness to the uh, uh, ambivalence of the um, powers of nature. So, oh, what do you say? What is, what is our time frame? Could I, could I ask a very quick question? Uh, this notion of creative self withdrawal in the context of God talk and uh, talk of spirit, is there a canonic, canonic, is, is there a canonic reference here, or is it purely accidental? I didn't understand your question. So, your notion of creative self withdrawal in the context of talking about the divine and the spirit. 
Is that purely coincidental or is there a canonic oh, yeah. reference? Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. Because I only heard you yeah. talk about it in relationship to yeah. the human. Could you say something how you see of that? Of course. In relation to the design? Of course. And we have we have worked a lot on on the notion also of sacrifice. Uh, and uh, the, uh, an important differentiation that you said you cannot do in German or Russia, opfer, sacrifice a victim, very, very complicated situation. And uh, we had a very powerful Habilitationsschrift on uh, opfer als Gedächtnis, uh, sacrifice as memory, um, uh, arguing that already the incarnation is a sacrificial act, and that it is very important not to confuse just sacrifice and gift. Because uh, you can uh, very easily illustrate it uh, in, in our ordinary language. If a rich relative gives you $10,000 for your studies, you say, oh, what a good gift. And uh, at least in, in the German language, if a poor relative gives you $10,000, um, uh, you say, oh, this was really a sacrifice. And so uh, the differentiation in German is Gabe und Ferga, so that you really have to give something that is hard, that, that it's, uh, it includes an element of suffering and uh, yeah, hardship. But uh, this still requires the important differentiation between sacrifice and victimization, which is often confused and then you get very pernicious thoughts. So, uh, so the point is that you have this uh, canonic sacrifice already in the, in the divine, but you have the human victimization. And that God continues to sacrifice, not because God wants the victimization, despite the victimization. So they are very, very uh, interesting areas. But uh, today I want to uh, create a self-withdrawal um, and not move too much into the areas that have been very important for me in the last 20 years, namely Christology and uh, all the issues that you were uh, getting. It seems to me that. Uh the ascent of human life has threatened the earth in profound ways, and um, we end up with seven, 7 billion people living through robbery, like you say, uh, necessarily so. Um, you mentioned any form of evil being ecological or environmental brutality. I'm just wondering, do you have a, it may not be your expertise or anything, but do you have an intuitive sense of uh, how do we differentiate between um, sort of the necessary impact of 7 million people living through robbery and, and brutality. And, and maybe a sub-question would be, um, is human flourishing and it seems to me that, that the ecological situation poses some tragic choices where maybe non trivial goods, different parts of human flourishing we have to Choose between. Does the ascent of life provide a way to differentiate between us? Of course, and we have to offer a north car. And I when I make this point that with the right of quotation, life is a robbery and requires justification. And I did not want to say life is only wrong. So I think it was a kind of counter argument against those who regard life and nature as salvific terms in itself. But I also mentioned, although only shortly, life has a lot of fecundity, beauty many, many reasons to be grateful for, and the human beings are not only uh, uh, robbers and brutal sinners, uh, no, they are, they are loving. We, are, we have an enormous amount of creative self-withdrawal in our own favor. And I try to explain this to the students, uh, that even if you come from complicated family situations, you wouldn't be near if you would not have an enormous amount of creative self-withdrawal in your favor uh, to sustain your life. And I think it is, it is enormous what, uh, what kind of uh, a grace and benevolence uh, we experience even in, so to speak, cool uh, uh, functioning environments. So I don't, do not want to uh, preach the gospel of un uh, ungratitude and, uh, and uh, painting everything in a, in a bloody way. But I think it belongs to a realistic approach to also see this aspect of life. And then we need the discernment of the spirit. And then we also see, well, we cannot have a standardized form. Some will decide, I have to become a vegetarian in order to yeah, live with a, with, a, with a good conscience and, uh, and so on and so on. And 
and others will uh, have other decisions. And I think you, again, we have to have a kind of spectrum of giving respect and, and not saying, well, all those who do not follow my uh, uh, own uh, uh, modes of life decision are um, uh, yeah, uh, put into a kind of uh, immoral, uh, in, in, into a box of immorality. So uh, I think we need the spectra of uh, uh, tolerance and negotiation and, of course, cultural learning. And I think we have come, come uh, quite, quite a long way and uh, we should not underestimate these enormous challenges that uh, we had in a globally communicating society. In 1977, I came for the first time into this beautiful country. I did research on writing. And uh, when I decided, uh, after the advice of your Goldman, to work on writing, I went to the Tübingen Library and they had only one book. And I came to the United States, there was no email contact. You had only heard from, well, there are some writers' schools and so on. I came back and gave a list of 450 uh, book titles and the University Library of Tübingen bought all 450 in uh, one stroke. But one cannot imagine how uh, yeah, different the world of those days was from the world in which we are at the moment. Uh, today you go in and say, oh, process theology. And then you see what is what is going on, and this brings a lot of good information, but also an enormous amount of political, moral, religious, and other challenges. So, in, in, a, in, a, in a way, we could live pretty much blinded, and so we have to give ourselves time for our moral and um, civil, religious, and uh, civil societal developments. Um, I'm a restless person. Um, so, uh, patience is not my main virtue, but uh, on the other hand, we live in very, very complex cultural uh, situations where we have to acknowledge that we need quite long ways for fruitful and sustainable and truth and justice supporting uh, developments. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.